This is episode. Oh shit! This is episode sixteen of the ANR Design Unholstered podcast. I am your host, Alex Costa. Today we have Mike, owner of Kilo NYC, Kilo Tactical. Uh, Mike started his uh, roots in New York in fashion, and we're gonna learn today why he jumped into the tactical side and how far his market really reaches. He's got a ton of fans in Japan. Um, awesome stuff. His fashion line is great. We have a bunch of his stuff here at the house and he's one of the nicest people that I have met in this industry. He's constantly always checking in. We have long, long, deep thought conversations with one another and he's definitely someone uh, that I want you guys all to meet. So Mike, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, introduce yourself, tell a little bit about how, tell us a little bit about how you started and, and what kind of brought you to where you are today. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Alex. Really appreciate it. And I also appreciate you having me over for dinner uh, a few months back. That steak was uh, awesome. Um, so, yeah, you know, as, uh, as Alex said in, in the intro here, I started um, in the men's fashion world um, doing the trade shows. We'd go out to Vegas and New York, and we would do the uh, – sort of like the contemporary men's trade shows slash streetwear. So we're talking agenda show, capsule, Liberty fairs. And we started out on, in that market because that's what I was interested in at the time. Uh, started this business in college and we just, we were connoisseurs of five panel hats and we were rock Stussy and pretty much brands like that. I grew up wearing the hundreds and uh, we SC uh, publish you know, that's that sort of vibe. And, um, you know, we did get some success in those first few years. Um, starting out, we got into Urban Outfitters, got into Saks, got into this sweet department store in Canada. But um, one thing that I had found was that, you know, my co-founder and I had very different visions. And one thing that I had always been personally interested in were uh, camo patterns, guns, and military history, especially. And we did a little experiment in, uh, in 2018. I went ahead and bought the legit multicam, bought it by the yard from Brookwood and made some bomber's jackets out of it. And uh, bomber jackets and parkas with all matching hats. So we did MCB, MC Original, and Multicam Alpine. And uh, the collection just did really well. And we found that there were some people online that really, really liked it. They understood it more than the typical fashion crowd we were selling to. And that was the two-way community. So I was really happy that there was someone that really understands the product and, and what's special about it. So we just haven't turned back ever since. That's awesome. And it kind of reminds me of that photo of Drake sitting courtside at an NBA game wearing multicam and people going fucking crazy about it after that. Almost like, oh, where the fuck was this the entire time? You know? Um, so... You started in fashion, you got into the camos, you love military history, you have a V2 rocket on one of your Kilo NYC shirts, which is great. Um, That's pissed people off, by the way. Really? The v yeah, yeah. Why? It's just history. So, yeah, well, Tactical Distributors actually sells that, that um, crew neck. And they hit me up. They were they sent me an email. They're like, people are complaining about this. Like, what? What's the idea behind this? And I'm like, dude, it's conspiracy theory related. You know, it's Operation Paperclip. Yeah. How we took, you know, the best scientists from the Third Reich and the Soviet took as many. They, they took as many as they could, and we just put them into NASA. And on the back of the crewnecks is Operation Paperclip. But sometimes people just see a something with the Third Reich, and they think we're promoting that. Um, it's just history. Yeah, it's just yeah. history. <laughs> I'm I'm actually listening to an audiobook right now from the perspective of a KGB officer talking about his anti-American operations. I love that shit. I love oh, history. that guy. Yeah. Um, I the book is I'll look it up real quick since I had it like loaded, but I've been listening to a lot of Cold War audiobooks because I really like the. Um, it's called Spy Master. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, right? <laughs> I can't remember so many Russian names being fired off in this, but um, it, it's a great book. Um, I, I finally like uploaded my Audible account and been recovering from surgery all week. So I listened to the Moscow Rules, which was a great book. 
Uh, that was American perspective of clandestine operations in Moscow and how they brought in like magicians from LA, uh, FX, uh, Hollywood FX makeup artists and, and costume designers and mask designers from LA to work in the Moscow branch and, and create this element of uh, concealment for the CIA, which I thought was super fucking interesting. It's a, it's a different perspective, right? Um, but I want to learn more about that about the cold war and and i think one of the wars that people don't talk about enough is the korean war and why that happened and and funny enough the spy master they explained why the korean war war happened and it was like one american that got in bed with a, a red sparrow and was it pretty much galvanized the initial stages of the korean war for the soviets and north korea so just shit like that when i'm like man i didn't know that like I want to learn all of this. <laughs> that, so. that book that you're reading right now, is that written by the guy that, like, there's many clips on YouTube of him explaining how the KGB, like, the way they operate, it's like information warfare over a course of 20, 30 years, how they, they'll, like, infiltrate a society and get into academia and then basically just demoralize their, you know, their the culture. Country. Oh, Yeah right yeah and, was... and then from there they just affect the whole culture so that 20 30 years from now you know they've they've undermined cultural institutions religion like everything like that yeah it, it's it's a officer's perspective because he he really didn't care about destroying culture it wasn't his mo right he was part kg he was kgb because he thought he was fearful of his family's life like, oh, if I defect or if I do this, like, they're going to kill my family. But they were killing good people. They were killing off um, people of the arts, people of theater, uh, movie directors, writers. Uh, it was Stalin's master plan to, like, essentially sanitize um, because Russia. Oh, we lost you, Mike. Uh, Russia, Russia was getting more. They call it cosmopolitan, but they were getting more cosmopolitan in Moscow. Uh, adopting a lot of westernized clothing and movies and books and stalin looked at russia and said fuck it, everyone's more patriotic towards russia they're not patriotic enough towards stalin so he started it was like i think it was like 1950 or 1949 to 1953 that stalin like per they called it the purge right they purged academia they purged um they made uh jews uh, a villain after Russian uh, Stalin during World War II actually set up a Jewish um, uh, a Department of State that was to to help the Jews, right? And then after that, he turned them into villains to try to you know create himself as a hero. So he actually persecuted them after having an entire government organization to protect them and to revitalize. Uh, Jewish communities within the Soviet Union because, you know, Soviets went all the way to Berlin and occupied that whole area. And at first he had this like, oh, well, let's revitalize the Jewish population here and then turn them into villains, jailed all the people that worked for him in the organization that he set up, calling them traitors. It was like just complete paranoia and, um, you know, book burning and all that shit. And it's wild and, and obviously caused a lot of KGB people to defect because they're like, we're not Russians anymore. We're Stalinites, you know? So I, I, I find that interesting, the perspective. And, and uh, fucking wild. Dude, this, uh, this reminds me of one of my favorite books I've read in the past few years. It's called uh, um, Inside the Aquarium by a former GRU operative, which is like the rival organization, the KGB. The military side. Yeah, I mean, it's also a spy organization, but it was even more secretive than the KGB. Yeah. Uh, it was called the GRU, and this guy, his name is Viktor Suvorov. He's got several books out. And one of the things he was talking about was that when he was going through the spy school through GRU, um, he, like, he never knew when he was secretly being tested because, like, they would set each other up. They would set the spies up against each other, even when they're just in the organization as operatives. Like you never know if someone is making a mistake and they want you purposely to rat your own guy out. And right. if you don't, you're being watched as well. So you could, you could never slip up. But one of the stories that really stuck with me was how in order to pass that spy school, 
he had to get one of the Soviet Union's own citizens to feed him sensitive information. And obviously that person would be meet a very miserable end, but they had to be able to do that. So they sent him to some uh, like nuclear facility. I mean, I could be getting that part wrong, but some sort of like missile silo town in the north of Russia. And they sent him there and he had to get someone there to spill secrets to him. And one of the rules was specifically, you can't get a woman to do it because that's too easy and that doesn't count. Like they, they literally like, it's off limits. You can't just seduce some woman and get her to spill secrets. And presumably he did go ahead and complete that course and who knows what happened to the, you know, to the guy who spilled it. But that's one story that stuck out. And the other one was how uh, he ended up being stationed in, it was either Austria or Czech Republic as a diplomat, right? Like quote unquote diplomat. And, but his job is to, you know, find out information and, you know, um, it's probably Czech Republic. And, yeah, I think it was probably Czech Republic, but it, it was somewhere in Central Europe. And I learned that the way that, that his little team worked, it's almost like sales guys. Like you've got the few, like the one to two heavy hitters that do all the work that are like getting all the good leads, if you will. Right. And then all these other trained officers are just like little peons. Like if you're not pulling in real weight, then you just got to do bitch work for like the, for the big boys. Like you're just <laughs> dropping off packages, depositing things in a bush, just pure support work. In a bush. And so he, <laughs> so he, he, he was doing that until he came up with this idea that his boss really liked, which was to invest in Alpine tourism because he found out that a lot of naval, like American naval officers like to, you know, take summers off in the mountains of Austria or whatever. So he got his boss to agree to invest. They bought some little fancy hotel in the, in the mountains. And then he was actually able to meet American officers and uh, I guess get some work done. Well, that sounds good. I just actually was on my phone trying to find it. You said inside the aquarium? Yeah. Did you find it? No, it's not on Audible. I'll have to find out where. I, I don't have time to sit down and read books right now, so I just throw them on audio. I throw an audio book on while I'm working. Um, I've crushed like three books this week. <laughs> um, that sounds great. I know that you like that book because you we, when you came to visit my home uh, and spent time with me and my wife, you talked about that book so oh really yeah you did you did i know we were drinking i know we were drinking and i uh, partying a little hard but um i do remember you talking about that and and, and it's funny that you said that because it took a long time for russia to start to invest time and money into women operatives it was almost like yeah they're not good enough and then they came out with like the red sparrow campaign um but for a long time, like, you didn't really have to worry about the women in Russia for a long time. So, like, the CIA operatives just, you know, paid no mind to them until later on. So it's kind of interesting you said that. And then, yeah, and, and so, so the GRU is military intelligence, whereas, like, KGB is State Department intelligence. Um, so I, I'm trying to think of what the... U.S. equivalent would be, I think it would just be military intelligence. I don't know what the acronym is in the United States, but yeah, they have their own military intelligence and then they have the KGB and the GRU could get away with a lot more because it was in the sake of war. <laughs> Whereas like KGB and CIA battling each other, it was more of like a PNG campaign where it's like, oh, we caught you. We know who you are. Um, we're going to interrogate you for a couple hours, maybe torture you a little bit, but not bad. And then uh, give you back to your embassy, and you're you're back, you're off, you're out of Moscow, you're out of Russia, and then, you know, CIA would recycle, you know, their their officers somewhere else in the world where their cover's not blown, and um, so it was like almost like a PNG where like, oh, we got you, see it, it's like tag, you're it, you're out, you know, get the fuck out of here, and um, where the GRU is kind of like nasty, like more like killings and shit, whereas. The KGB killed their own people more than they killed foreign people. And the GRU would do more horrendous things. So, man, Cold War. I don't know why they don't teach this shit in school. 
I mean, did you did, did my screen go black there again? I'm getting so many spam calls these days. It's ridiculous. Uh, no, I you're just, good. Uh, you're good. Yep. Um, but yeah, I wish I wish they taught more about this kind of stuff in school. I don't I don't remember spending more than like a chapter in a history book on the Cold War in high school. Yeah. I agree. Did you learn um, did you learn war history at all in high school? Did you have that opportunity? Just about everything about history that I know is just from reading, researching myself, and YouTube's such a great resource yeah. with uh, all the channels that are out now. But just because you mentioned torture just now, I have to, I <laughs> speaking of torture, I have to mention this book that uh, there's some big podcasts out there that have already talked about it, but there's this book called The Interrogator. And it's about the most successful interrogator that the Luftwaffe had in oh, World God. War II, about, <laughs> about this guy, Hans Scharf. And he was just such a nice guy that, like, not only was he able to get something out of everyone, but he moved to L.A. after the war and even befriended some of his former captains, if you will. Um, he was just, uh, yeah, he was, um, sorry about that. Killed them with kindness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he he would he would just be a supreme gentleman, but he would also make make them feel like, look, we already know everything there is to know about you. We already know this, that, and the third, and they'd be like, oh, smoke, oh holy smokes, I didn't know you, you know all that. And he would just kind of wear them down day after day, and invite them over for tea, go go for walks with them in the woods, and you know he would just over that period of time just tell them what it is he knows to the point that they're just convinced that he knows everything. Right. And then one innocent sounding question is just like, Oh, he didn't actually know that though. And you might've just given it up. Um, yeah. Su super fascinating book. That one. That sounds good too. I want to, I want to, I'm going to, I have to write these down after we get done. Um, one that I did listen to was on the Jocko podcast. I can't remember the name of it. I'm not going to read it. Listening to Jocko read like four paragraph or four chapters out of it was enough for me to be like, fuck, okay, I'm good. It was um, German. It wasn't, it was like a special police. It wasn't the Gestapo or anything like that. It was like a special police force that was militarized for World War II. And they did not see combat. Their only job was to go and round up Jewish people. And they would go into villages and the jet the the commanding officer of this this unit was like like trembling in his boots like i got the word from hitler that we have to do this so they went to a polish town a village that i think there was like three thousand people it was a pretty big village pretty big town and they went in and gathered everyone up and walked them all out to the forest and started fucking executing everyone in mass grave and before it kicked off the commanding officer was like I don't want to do this. If you don't want to do it, we're not going to hold it against you. Right now, you have, we have a couple minutes before we kick this off. You have, right now, if you come forward, I'm not going to hold it against you. We're not going to court martial you. Just go home. Pretty much just like, turn your rifle in and go fuck off. And a bunch of people did. A bunch of people were like, I'm not doing this. Like, we're police officers. We're not. Uh, we're not military. This is not a military operation. This is like people that realized that it was straight up genocide walked away. Now this, this commanding officer did not stand on the front lines, but he let it happen. And the whole point of this book and the whole point of the podcast was like, just because it's an order doesn't mean it's right. And he read some super horrific events that these, these officers went through where they were like executing people, they weren't shooting them in the head correctly, people were still alive, and it was 3,000 people executed in this town, and, and absolutely horrible, and, and it taught, it was more of like a psychological deep dive into like what happened to these guys afterwards, because they, these guys never saw combat through the whole war. Their only job was to execute people, and they were police officers. Like they believed that they were just like upholding the peace. And then they get ordered to start executing people. And it's that you see that split between people that can't do it anymore. Like people realize that they've killed two or three people and they're like, this is so fucking horrifically wrong. I can't be there. And they leave. But but the time they're committed, you know, they can get court martialed once they've already committed it. It was fucking brutal. And it was, the whole book was just about like this incident and and all the different facets and all the and all, it was like different perspectives. And I was like, man, I'm good. 
I'm real good. <laughs> I don't yeah, know I, 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 I think I'm good on that too. I mean, it yeah. just sounds so heavy. It, it's super heavy. I mean, but I, I, I read this stuff and I watch, you know, I, I, I love history and I love perspective and I want to learn about everything. It is, you know, like our past, like <laughs> what, what caused all this? <laughs> How do we get to this point, you know, and, and propaganda and, 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 how propaganda has worked as, as used as a tool and um i find it so fascinating but anyway <laughs> let's get back to let's get back to business all right so you yeah. love camo and then what was your first article piece of equipment what, what was the first thing you developed on the tactical side when you launched kilo tactical um well before launching kilo tactical we had done the citadel backpack with gwa Clear Horse Anonymous, and that was like our first piece of like legit kit, and it was pricey, but in my opinion, well worth the price because it's such a well-made backpack. So going into Kilo Tactical, we did another one of those, and I think that the first piece of kit that that we made that people, um, you know, that we're actually known for is the convertible pouch, that little the F boy bag that you see me wearing like this, but in fact, yeah, there you go. Prop time. But you know that converts into a into a dangler pouch that you put on your on your uh, plate carrier or chest rig. Can tear off the back, put it up into your chest rig, and you're good to go as a dangler. And you can simply do you leave these on or is it split? I didn't check. Yeah, yeah we could take those off. So they're split back. Oh yeah, they're clip on. There you go. You get a little clip in the back. Pop the clip off. And you can turn it in from a little shoulder bag, fanny pack type deal, to a dangler. This thing's rad. <laughs> in yeah, dude, I, I I freaking love those for travel, man. Just pack several of those. You can just throw them in your backpack and have one on you. It just like I actually don't lose things anymore. I don't lose keys, AirPods, anything. This is coming to London with me for DSEI. Um, this will be with our UK distributor. So when people see Rhodesian on a little shoulder bag. With all my shit in it, <laughs> draw some attention. So that was your first product. You've done collaborative drops with a bunch of different companies. You've yep. done shorts. You've done what else have you done? Tell well, us yeah, all jackets. The, tell us all the cool stuff you've done. You've done the work jackets. Those are pretty rad. Yeah. Yep. Did the workman jackets. Launched those with warm fuzzy. Got to do bucket hats with Subtech, which was cool because there aren't a whole lot of bucket hats out there. So uh, <laughs> truth. <laughs> Corey looks but great making, in a bucket hat. <laughs> he looks a lot better than I do. I look like an Asian grandma <laughs> with the bucket hat. Like I should be pushing one of those shopping carts on Canal Street. Oh my god! Um, but no, like honestly, a bucket hat made out of a thousand D Cordura feels really protective. <laughs> I like bet. from rain and wind and stuff. You <laughs> can fucking probably take a 45 ACP round at 100 yards <laughs> and be okay. <laughs> it definitely feels like that. It definitely feels like that. Um, what else? Yeah, you know, we've done slings, done all kinds of manners of jackets, did a Sherpa, did this big warm Sherpa jacket collab. Um, yeah, what's fun about collabs is we get to kind of experiment and do patterns that we might, you know, might not typically do, you know, right. do something a bit off the beaten path. That's uh, very special. Um, and speaking of collabs, I was looking at Noveski's website recently and I saw um, your, your collab with them with the tattoo patterns on them. Tell me about that. Uh, Dylan, tough ass hats. He, he, uh, him and I were talking and he was like, dude, it'd be pretty tight to put, you know, Americana on, Holstered. And I was like, dude, at the time I know he just got out to um he just got out west. He was he's real close with Noveski, and we're like, let's get something rolling with Elrad. And uh we got it done. Uh we produced quite a bit. There's still there's still excess on both our websites. I think Noveski sold out about 90% of their goods. We've sold out about 65% of our stock, which is fine. It was a cool drop. Uh, we enjoyed it. I think it's a cool print. It's it's definitely super niche, though. So it's one yeah. of those things like you have to want pink and teal on your kit uh, to rock it. But I think 
it's the perfect timing. I think there's so many people that like that whole genre of uh, aesthetic. There's a lot of people that'll have like their super Gucci multicam fucking battle belt set up. And then you have your, oh, we're going to the range and shooting photos with our friends and having fun uh, battle belt set up. And they rock, they rock those mad carriers and stuff like that. So that's tight. Um, yeah, collabs are cool. Collabs are definitely cool. Um, we, we, we should do a penoplage drop. <laughs> have you seen our penis camo? No. Or maybe oh. I have, actually. Dude, we have Chodesian bush stroke. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chodesian. Yeah, so we have, we have a bunch of different uh, patterns. Um, I think there's 13 patterns total. I have a federal trademark filed for it. Um, so it's protected. And the feds want me to release, you know, so much a year to keep my standing for my trademark status. So we're doing a drop on Friday. By the time this airs, the drop will be over. But um, we're doing a drop and we're pretty stoked. I'm trying to liquidate a ton of stuff because <laughs> we, we what we realized is we just moved our shop to a new location. And we realized we have so much excessive stuff that we're just like, yeah, let's move it. So we decided to drop a ton of penoflage almost all of it and it's it's not a lot i think it's like 125 sheets of different styles and um i need to continue showing proof to the feds that i'm using it it's for commerce we're selling it here's a trademark here it is on the on the kydex you know it says penaflage trademark you know so it's it's my annual like prove prove them prove it to them uh bullshit so yeah, I just I love I love that bureaucrats have to review your penaflage with some level of regularity. There's someone somewhere just you know studying that. Well, we kind of had to, and uh, TJ Kurgen from Tactical Shit, super good dude, he's a friend. But there was a time when he was using our phrase that we came up with, like we called it penaflage first, and I, I I texted him. I was like, hey, bud. You gotta change the name of your product. I do have a registered trademark uh, through the through the patent, U.S. Patent Office, and he was like, "Okay, fuck you, but okay," <laughs> you know. So he's a good sport about it. Um, but yeah, well, historically, so we would never drop that. Historically, it was like if you want this, you gotta send us a care package. It has to contain a bottle of whiskey or bourbon or scotch something you like well it doesn't have to be if you have moonshine really nice vodka you know some people have said tequila i'm not crazy about tequila and um some components of the care package have to be personal like someone from Te uh, fal addicts uh on instagram i don't know if you've ever seen fal addicts it's fal underscore addicts all fal content um, fal he sent a texas flag some goodies and hot sauce from Bucky's, which is like a Texas staple. If you guys don't know what yep. Bucky's are, um, some jerky from Bucky's, um, salsa from Bucky's, um, some stickers, and a bottle of uh, Texas honey whiskey or something like that. And it was wrapped. So we want people to send care packages that is something that is important to them, like you know, a consumable, because you know we share that with the, the guys at the shop and whatnot. And uh, it's it's fun. And then we give them a special code that they can access and purchase penaflage for their order. And um, it allows, so we're, we've been doing the drop to right-handed CNC cut only. We haven't had any left-handed stuff cut yet. Like we haven't cut the tooling for left-handed. So if people want penaflage, they have to send in care packages to get left-handed holsters handmade. And we do that. So they still, they're still paying for the good, but the care package is to unlock you know, the unobtainium. So we'll have to come out with some new patterns soon so that there's fresh unobtainium to continue the tradition. But it's, it's a lot of fun, man. It really is. Um, we have a lot of fun with it. It's just funny. Like people in this industry take life too fucking seriously all the time. And it's kind of fun just to fart around and do something stupid. And you get all the bozos that are like, oh, you must be fucking homosexual because you're putting dicks on things like all right dude cool i'm i'm comfortable with myself chill the fuck out or um or you know the dudes oh what about mammoth mammoflage what about some titty ca uh camo like 
no, I don't want to alienate my female audience. Like, dicks are funny. <laughs> you know? I'm not going to come out with some fucking titty camo. Like, no way. Get out of here. We were already accused of having dicks in our camouflage just by using Oscam. Oh. Um, and uh, I never saw the dicks in the Oscam before, but once you see it, you can't unsee it. Especially with Oscam Desert, which has uh, purple dicks in it. Dicks. Yeah. Beanie triumphant yeah. bastards. Um, yeah, I mean the the Australians they lovingly call it hearts and bunnies, which yeah you'll <laughs> see some hearts and bunnies in there. But I'm like, dude, that's not what Americans. That's not what we see in it. That's funny. That is really funny. Yeah, um, I also have a lot of fun writing the copy for the website. <laughs> so Friday when they drop, definitely take a peek at it Friday evening, and um, the copy is funny. Because we call them appendix holsters, like D-I-C-K-S, instead of mm -hmm. D-I-X. So lots of play on words, lots of dick puns, um, and, uh, you know, fuck it. Have fun with it, right? So yeah. so how's Kilo? Talk about your, your expanse. Talk about your reach. You have a ton of fans in Japan. Ton, I see we have so many Japanese people buying our holsters and our optic mounts, part of the Airsoft community that is like super stoked about anything drop hype beast related. They want the real deal optic mounts. They want the real deal lights to put on their airsoft guns and they want that Gucci ass kit. So talk about your Asia uh, reach and, and how, how impactful that is on your business. Yeah. I mean, I don't really, I don't really know. I, I can't really explain it. We do have three retailers in Japan buying our stuff. And then even the, even so, we'll get the, the online orders from the Japanese uh, customers too. We were in a Hong Kong retailer for a while as well. Um, you know, and then there's a lot of Europe that comes in online. But I'm assuming the Japanese are airsofters, right? Because they, yeah. they can't. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It, it was actually a Japanese uh, gentleman. Um, I forget his handle on Instagram. It's like Ichi and then a number. And he started buying Anvil Ukons off our website, uh, direct to Japan, and he would tag us in it. He put them on his TP9 airsoft gun or he put it on his M4. And he'd tag us. And then I was like, dude, thank you so much for buying the real deal for an airsoft gun. That's super cool. And he's like, well, I'm not going to buy the Chinese knockoff. And he sends me links to like three websites selling Chinese knockoffs of our product. And there's three different, or there, I think there's one manufacturing company that has multiple distributors out of China for airsoft. That's ripping our shit off. But they, they falsely advertise it. They advertise that it fits other optics that doesn't fit. And um, it's funny, we've had customers buy that shit. You know, they're like 30 bucks on eBay and they're not built correctly. You know, they don't have the internal components that are correct. And um, they're not to spec either. And they're like, oh, my optic doesn't fit on this. And we're like, that's not ours. We never released that site post to production. It was a render that we used for the website when we first kicked it off. And it's, it's pretty funny. It's pretty fucking funny. Something, something, imitation, flattery, something. Exactly. You know, yeah. but I think it's really cool that the Japanese airsoft community has this this really strong, deep-seated integrity of buying the real deal, not buying the knockoff. They're kind of like, ah, I want the real okay. deal. So Japan, in general, loves made in USA stuff. Like, they, they love US-made, like, bags and denim and, you know footwear and that's just on the fashion side so tactical side it makes a lot of sense to me that they're always looking for like the real american made stuff well it's like um china too though likes american brands that might be made in china <laughs> it's like yeah right they, uh, at our old building that we used to operate out of there was a chinese export company downstairs ow Ooh, that hurt i have fucking dry hands and i think i just scratched through my fucking tissue um there was a Japanese or a Chinese export company downstairs and they would get our packages all the time and we would go and talk to them and we'd use like Google translate and type out and it would show, you know, Chinese to them. I don't know if it was Mandarin or Cantonese. And the guy set it up for me so I could talk to him every time I went down there. Um, his name was May and 
they would get our guns a lot too <laughs> like fedex was so horrible they would deliver our guns to them and we'd go down and be like do you have our stuff and they're like yeah your guns <laughs> you know they were cool about it but they were the owner of that export company was the godson of the owner of alibaba and he was telling us like all the stuff that they get they literally buy so new hampshire is tax-free new hampshire is um has a ton of like outlets like tax-free outlets so they go to the outlets it'll be like They'll go on a website in China. The, the, the customer will go on a website in China, buy, oh, I want a blue polo shirt in this size. And this guy's family and his extended family that were stateside would go to the outlets and buy these clothes. They might not be identical to the clothes that they were advertising on their website, but it's close enough. And they would go and buy all this shit and they come back, repackage it. It's all made in China. They would repackage it box it up and they would pack these box trucks like fucking tetris dude like little boxes like a wall of boxes and they would freight them out back to china um just giant shipping containers send them back to china all the labels excuse me all the shipping labels on them and they would get distributed in china because it is infinitesimally more affordable to buy stuff from america and have it shipped back to china even though it's made in china and snowboards golf clubs fucking clothing shoes i mean we walk you walk into their packing area and they have 12 pallets of nike jordans just boxing them up and getting ready to fire them out and you're just like holy shit <laughs> that's the hilarious thing about global uh, global logistics like things being made in china arriving at the u.s brand and then getting shipped back to china yeah just like the the amount of traveling that these products do man absolutely wild yeah let's talk about a surgery dude <laughs> um well, talk about your no, I, actually a, I actually have a i actually have a funny sore surgery story yeah why are we recording yeah yeah all right cool um <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, dude. So I had a hernia surgery two months back. First time getting surgery as an adult. And I didn't get nervous until I was there because, man, it's unnerving. You know, you get naked, they got you in the gown, and now you're just sitting in the thing, and they're putting the IV in you. And you're like, any minute now, they're going to wheel me into that operating room. And uh, and then they shot me up with this thing called the lorazepam. Did you get that too? Uh, not lorazepam. I had lidocaine injections, and I'll talk about that when it's my turn because it was fucking miserable. <laughs> oh god. Okay. Well, lorazepam is amazing because I don't know what it is. Uh, it just made me incredibly accepting of everything. Like oh. someone could have. Uh, yeah, I could have been about to be executed, and I'd just be like, "All right." Well, like, they put you out for that, what? right? No, so the lorazepam, yeah, they did. But the lorazepam comes before they put you under. Right. You just, just to before. take the nerves off. Yeah, yeah, so as they're wheeling me in, it starts hitting me, and I just start feeling real funky and, like, real accepting. <laughs> and they, they wheel me into the operating room, and, and there's all these uh, these surgeons looking at me and stuff, and I'm like, what is this that you just gave me? This is great. <laughs> and they're like, duh, lorazepam, it's, it's like lithium. And... I'm like, lithium? Um, my dad told me that uh, that's what they used to give housewives, like middle-aged middle housewives back in the 50s. Yeah. And none of them laughed, and then I just went out. Yep. I just went out cold. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, wow, that's the last thing they heard me say before they're like, let's just put this, this mofo out. <laughs> um, so how are you feeling? Are you feeling like way better was it painful having that hernia yeah the, the the hernia i had been ignoring it for like four years it was just something that was like constant and i never just took care of it and um getting married in two weeks actually so i just didn't want to deal with that in the honeymoon right. i'm like all right fine i'll just go deal with it but i way overestimated my ability to recover from that because i thought i'd be back at work two days later but uh no yeah no <laughs> Like that, that first week, dude, and they, they did warn me about this, but like the blood 
sinks down into your testicles and then they're swollen and black and I didn't even want to look. Oh, it was a hernia there. And I finally looked. No, no, no. The hernia wasn't there. The hernia is up here. Oh, okay. The procedure causes blood to drop down. Oh, Jesus. So, yeah. That was probably the most brutal part for me was just trying to, like, walk to get to the bathroom. Yeah. No, that's not fun. And I I have had lorazepam uh, in April. I had my wisdom teeth extracted, all impacted. And I remember when they hit me with that, they're like, Oh, you know, just could calm you down a little bit before we stick the needle in. And I have like invisible veins, like they're buried. I've got like five going through here where everyone has like one jumbo vein. And the doctor's like, all right, I'm going to stick you, bud. And I'm like, uh, please don't not there. You're never going to get it. Hit me in the cheater vein in my wrist or like maybe, you know, and I, I had just gotten back through here. Yeah. The hand. And I yeah. had, dude, I hadn't been home more than fucking 16 hours from hanging out with Steve and Brett down at Texan Ammo. Uh, so I was w- in Texas. I had an abscess in my mouth, and I flew. To, uh, I literally flew home, and the next day my wife took work off and brought me to emergency extractions because I had such a bad infection. And they ripped those fuckers out. But they, when they hit me with a little razapan, I could tell that one of the orderlies, not orderlies, one of the people helping out with the surgery was the uh, oral surgeon's son, looked just like him. And he's like, sick fucking sleeves, bro. And I'm like, I'm like wearing pants, it's cold, it's April. I'm like, yo, just like roll up my leg sleeves real quick so you can see my leg sleeves, like slurring my words, falling asleep. They finally got the needle in my arm, you know, and the fucking doctor was like, I'm going to get your, I'm going to get it in your arm. I'm going to get that IV in. And I'm like, you're not going to fucking do it, dude. Like I've done this. I had surgery two years ago. They had to get a fucking ultrasound out and still couldn't do it and still went in my cheater vein. And I hate needles. Like, tattoos are one thing, but needles digging around in you make me fucking sick to my stomach. Um, so I was, like, getting hot and sweaty and shit. Like, just throw it in my fucking hand. <laughs> uh, so they did that, and then I just had a surgery uh, last Monday. I'm not going to get too much detail about it, but let's just say I had a former ingrown hair that turned into an abscess in my nether bits between my front bits and my back bit between my legs. And it was horrible. They had to slice out a wedge out of my uh, fleshy land bridge between my legs. And um, they glued it. They put internal stitches in the in the incision. It was about, about an inch deep. Just shy of an inch deep, cutting in a lip shape. Oh my God, dude. Poor, and then they ripped the whole thing out. Then they put a stitch in like 75% of the way through the incision and then glued up the incision front. And that glue went into the incision. It didn't stay on the outside. So it was like having a piece of glass in the incision for the past like fucking week. And it finally came out yesterday morning. Oh my God, dude. Every time I would sit, it felt like sitting on glass. It was fucking horrible. I'm oh, still dude. I'm still bleeding from it, but and I got infected. So I'm I was on it or I am on antibiotics. It, what a fucking nightmare, dude. But it'll be gone forever because I was also neglecting that injury for three years. <laughs> All that over an ingrown hair, huh? Dude, that was horrible. That abscess would literally bleed every day of my life. Like never would never healed up. It was just like a wound for three years. Finally had it cut out, and they cut everything out, and then stitched me back up. Wait, so even when you wait, you've had it for three years. So when we went UTV riding, when we were like overlanding and bouncing around on that thing, you felt that then too. Yeah, so it didn't really hurt. It never hurt. It would just fill up with blood and then drain. Fill up with blood and drain almost on a daily or every three day occurrence. And then like once every two months, it would get infected, and I have like a special topical to like treat it with the problem was i would have gotten this done years ago go to a gi go to a fucking dermatologist no sorry that's gi track i guess your nether region is technically gi skin it's not normal dermis so no i can't do it go to a fucking gastro go to a gastro oh we don't do that we do like internal surgeries it took me three years to finally find a doctor that would just fucking cut it out i don't know why dermatology couldn't do it what fucking gastro did was no different than what dermatology would have done, but they didn't want to... It was fucking stupid, dude. 
it was like dumb ass bureau bureaucratic doctor shit wow this is disgusting maybe we'll take it out of this podcast yeah or leave it in <laughs> or leave it in well my wife says no one needs to know what you had surgery on and i was like but it's just an ingrown hair it's just funny like i'm not embarrassed by it it just sucks yeah, yeah it's just, <laughs> just surgery man um but yeah you know what i wanted to ask you earlier what uh what are some of your favorite collabs or like most fun things that you've produced that you look back on you're like oh yeah that was rad yeah, collabs are cool. Um, probably the best collab that we've had was like the first one that we did with Warm and Fuzzy with the Afghan war print. That one was probably my favorite. That was nice. That was cool. Yeah. It was different. I think that's why it was cool. Um, in general, it's just production of stuff, designing new stuff, like our Ghidorah uh placard insert that we came out with that was fucking righteous that was a cool project that we worked on with velocity systems for uh we have an sr25 pattern one coming out soon and that's we designed that for militaries and then we talked to velocity systems i was like can i sell this to the consumer side to like recoup cash for production and they were like yeah absolutely like this is not it's not opsec it's not fucking um exclusive we just wanted you to make it for our stuff because we think it's better, you know, you're going to produce something better than what's on the market right now. Something that's more sturdy, more rigid, gets the job done better. And we're like, absolutely, let's do it. So we committed to that project. That was fucking fun. Um, I'm excited to show that project off in London with Velocity Systems in September during the release of that chess rig that I was wearing in Texas on the helicopter hunt. That chess rig doesn't come out till September, I think. So it was cool to, like, put rounds downrange with that that's rig with our system so that was probably my favorite one so far we have a bunch of other cloud a bunch of other projects that i've done we did one for a military unit for a c slam laser it's like the size of a desert eagle bigger than a desert eagle but it's a laser designator for aircraft that was a cool project and then we have we have a bunch of cool stuff coming we're doing a military project for a suppressor ready holster. We have shotgun breaching project, explosives breaching project, um, another breaching kit, like enclosure project, a bunch of stuff that we need to get done. And I finally able to steal my fucking engineers away from production development and get them back on new product introduction, new product development and military project development. Um, so I get them back in a couple weeks and then I get to do all the cool shit, all the stuff that's that like secret. revitalizes my love for making stuff out of plastic. That C slims, uh, thing sounds really cool. I've actually never seen any of those devices before. Go you on, said it's about the size of a desert eagle. It's bigger. Yeah. Go on disco right. 32, um, disco 32, put up like a fucking JTAC, uh, like compilation video, like two weeks ago. And you'll see somebody holding this big tan plastic looking fucking pistol with a doctor, like red dot on top. That's a C slam. Um, it's L3 was cool as fuck. Went down there. <laughs> L3's like down the street from the shop. Went down there, um, picked it up. Lady's like, here you go. Didn't even sign it out. Just here you go. Walked off with it. I think it's like a $40,000, $30,000 laser or something absurd. It's really fucking expensive. They oh, don't make wow. it anymore. I think there's a newer generation of it. But they gave me this one. She's like, cool, just don't break it. Give it back. There was no battery pack in it because like, you could like blind commercial aircraft pilots with it. That's how fucking powerful this laser is. So it's like, no battery pack for it. You know, do what you need to do. And we're like, all right. Just email her back, dropping it off. Boop, dropped it off. <laughs> <laughs> it was it's cool shit like that so when we work with some of the um tier one military units we get to kind of skirt the normal uh red tape that you would have to jump through to acquire such products to produce accessories they're you know aftermarket accessories for uh because of an email from someone somewhere special so it was cool we did 20 of them yeah. for for uh for three different tier one units that was cool the placard, you sh or rather the Kydex insert you showed me, looked really legit too. Thank you. Yeah. Really happy. Is that is that released yet? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we have that one done. Um, we worked with Coltac 
on creating a stiffener kit. So we made ours sit a little bit higher off the bottom of the actual kangaroo pouch because it's such a rigid design. It can sit a little higher and give you better indexing of your magazines, individual retention, uh, adjustable retention points. And then um, we came out with a Tegris stiffener kit so that you could map it to whatever chest rig kangaroo pouch that you're running. So we have two different, and we, in Ghidorah is, uh, you know, one of Godzilla's adversaries. And then, you know, they are all part of the genre of kaiju. So we came up with the kaiju stiffy kit. <laughs> so, um, and it's cool. It maps to, it maps to different uh, kangaroo pouches. And then the Tegris almost carries, it's a continuation of the uh, flared magwell in the Ghidorah uh, placard insert. So it creates that entire kangaroo pouch, becomes a super stiff, wonderful, easy to re-index, remove and put your mags back in um kangaroo pouch i don't i don't think you can find one on the market that's as simple like as easy to work from and the reason why we wanted that is you spend so much time on the fucking range with your spiritists or whomever like anyone that makes a nylon fucking stitch together elastic you know cheap cheapo depot um magazine insert for these placards you gotta like you pull the mag out and then your fucking mag pouch goes and you let me get my two fingers in there and spread it out so i can shove this bitch back in you know um you don't have to do that so you're probably going to save you know lots of time on the range in practice as well nice i, I wish i could say that my favorite stuff that we've made is as useful but you know our stuff's just silly man no, it's like not. Uh, i mean the alex jones t-shirts are some of my favorites and uh that's undoubtedly silly but that's it's fun, fun. This yeah this is not okay. silly this is fucking cool <laughs> and useful and yeah, has multifunction. Yeah, no don't short sell uh, yourself like that well the alex jones started off as a sticker that just said profit over his eyes <laughs> and 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 people wanted a t-shirt so then we made a t-shirt with him shirtless, just flexing like this. With that visceral fat belly. Yeah, right. With the, uh, with the gut. And, um, and then we did uh, another sticker as a collab with MP5 guys where we just photoshopped a bunch of tattoos on him. Where it was like totally tatted out, like teardrops on him and stuff. Uh, that yeah, that was fun. There was actually this one time that we tricked people not not necessarily trick people, but um, fall 2018 season, we had this black hoodie with an orchid embroidery, yeah, and um, just Japanese characters embroidered on the sleeve, and that was the look we were going for. You know, it's funny, a lot of people didn't even know what the orchid was, they thought it was something, uh you know, they thought it was like a vagina or something. I'm like, no, it's an orchid. <laughs> but, but I didn't even know what I wanted the Japanese to say, right? All I know is I just wanted Japanese on the sleeve to, to you know, to create a vibe. So just for, for fun and as a joke, for the sample, we just translated Make America Great Again <laughs> in Japanese and had that on the sample and took it to the trade shows, got a bunch of orders. Uh, but I forgot to change that for the full production. So the production came out and all of them just still said, make America great again in Japanese. And I had to, you know, I had all these orders to fulfill. We even ended up selling them direct to consumer at Afropunk Music Festival that year. Wow. And what? I, and there was one time that one of the store owners calls me up He's like, hey, I'm getting some questions from customers. Like, what does that say on it? This guy's store is in Brooklyn. Oh my god! And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I don't think you want to know what it says. And and then I told him, and then he was like, yeah, I'm not telling my customers that. <laughs> no, no, just yeah. let, let it fly. <laughs> let right. it fly. That's Although awesome. technically, technically though, due to the rules of the Japanese language, it technically says "Let's Make America Great Again," which is actually Reagan's campaign okay originally yeah okay so war on drugs yeah. it's fine yeah yeah um <laughs> that's awesome yeah, it's ridiculous uh do you have anything in, uh, uh other than your personal um 
your personal development, your personal life events coming up? Do you have anything uh, business related that you're excited to do? Anything you can talk about? Or is it all low key shit right now? Oh, definitely. Yeah, we've got a few things coming up with GBRS group. And, and those guys are cool, former uh, tier one operators. And they were, they were really kind to invite me out to Arizona back in December to go skydiving with them. And uh, <laughs> that was my first time skydiving. So I was just like, man, I'm pretty sure it tops out here. Um, so yeah, great group of guys, learned a lot from them. And we're just super stoked to make stuff with them. And all of the stuff we're doing is going to be multicam black because that's their thing. Yep. Uh, I know some people really don't like multicam black, but I still think it's a cool pattern. It's cool. It serves no purpose, but it's cool. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. A, it's an intimidator, right? It didn't Christ like legitimately come out and say like, this has, this doesn't do what you think it does. This is straight up for like psyops intimidation. See a yeah. bunch of dudes rolling in multicam black. You're like, Oh fuck. Butthole pucker. <laughs> Someone, someone once commented on one of our posts on Instagram. They called it multicam cub stain, and uh, <laughs> I can never look at uh, multicam black quite the same since that. I can't. Oh, this reminds me of a meme that I saw yesterday. Um, how come mom and dad don't let us eat in bed? I see yogurt stains all over their bed. <laughs> oh God, we're going to hell. Anyway. Well, well, that, that, that problem could be solved with multicam black sheets. Yes. Sheet. You won't know where the yogurt stains are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I drive a multicam black truck. Can't wait to call wait. it yogurt stain camo. <laughs> Do you think that would sell? Do you think people would buy that multicam black sheets? Dude, you, should just, somebody you would. should just do a yogurt stain design. <laughs> but different shades and hues of yogurt stains and call it a oh, camo and see what sells. Gross. I'm kidding. Oh I'm kidding. God. All right, we are we are straying from the path here. <laughs> um, we have, we have strayed far from the path. Well, path my righteous. my gooch can't handle any more sitting. <laughs> I'm like slowly slouching in my chair, trying to get air on my wound right now. <laughs> so, um, shit, Mike, you're an absolute fantastic human being. Um. Some people will be like, why are we sitting here talking about like stuff that I, we're not talking about guns or tactics or training, but the, the whole purpose of this podcast is to kind of get the face behind companies out and, you know, um, kind of the background, what brought you to this point in life and, and what's most important uh, to your brands and everyone that's on the shows, you know, their core ideals and values that are important to them. As you know, we had Corey on. People don't know that Corey came from like the hip hop industry. Um, you know, we we've had uh, tons of people on here that people are like, "Wait, what? They came from where?" <laughs> so I think it's super rad that you started in fashion and camouflage was what bridged you to the tactical community. It sounds very close to Caleb Cry, where fashion in New York City developed camo pattern and, and, and went from fashion to military I, I think it's super rad dude you make great products you have a really strong reach everyone i've ever met that knows you says nothing but great things about you and uh and i enjoy our three-hour conversations that we have just completely glued to randomness that we talk about but it, it, it's so it, it's fulfilling conversations because it's like deep thought kind of stuff so i i want to say i appreciate you thank you for your friendship and thank you for being on this mm -hmm. show. Thank you so much for the kind words, Alex. It's really, truly always a pleasure talking to you, man. And I'm so happy for you. Congratulations. You're getting married. You're moving. I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a wrap up on uh, episode 16 of the a &R Design Unholstered podcast. I'm your host, Alex Costa, and uh, it was a pleasure having Mike, owner of Kilo Tactical, Kilo NYC, on the show today. Hope you guys enjoyed it and are rambling. <laughs> we do ramble. You and I just, if you could fucking put a diagram and, and draw out our thought processes on paper, and like this was mellow. 
Like we've sat on yeah, my porch. Yeah, this wasn't bad. We sat on my porch <laughs> drinking whiskey, and it's gotten fucking weird. And my wife was there, like amped up, like, "What are we talking about, guys?" Like, <laughs> you know. And we had your friend. Your friend came over too, and we just like spiraled. Good spiral, positive spiral. It, it's always a fun. It's always fun talking to you, dude. Always a ride, man. Always a good ride. We'll, we'll have to get together soon. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, man. Talk soon.